pleasure to welcome James Rickards from CU Boulder and soon to be St. Mary's. Um, will tell us about the not so local, not so local global conjecture. All right, thank you, uh, Artem, for the introduction. Um, so let's get started with our our main topic of today. Um, so something uh, that dates back to Apollonius um, is this theorem where he says if you take three tangent circles in the plane, you can draw exactly two more circles that are tangent to the original three. So we don't exactly know what Apollonius did with this problem. We just have some account that he studied this in some way. Um, and so this is really the origin of what we're going to do today. Um, so for some pictorial examples, here's three tangent circles. And you can see that you can draw one in the middle here. And then you can also draw one that's sort of externally tangent to all three of them, like so. And no matter what configuration of three circles, there's always exactly two that you can draw. Here's just another configuration. And so here you can always draw one in the middle, uh, but then you can also draw one that's sort of externally tangent to them on this side here, uh, just like that. Um, and so this is what makes what we call an Apollonian circle packing. So we start with three tangent circles. You draw the two given by Apollonius, uh, but now you see there's a whole lot more holes we can fill. We can fill it over here, over here, down here, and then these three right like that, and then there's six more circles you can draw, and then every time it triples, and eventually you get a picture that looks something like this. Uh, and so this is what we call an Apollonian circle back. Um, so here, of course, we, we have to stop at some point. So here I've taken all the circles and raised at least one over 500. And of course this goes on to infinity, but we get a picture that looks something like this. Um, so we wanna make some algebra in the equation. So actually, if I go back, you know, if you're given sort of these three circles, um, because there's only two more that you can draw, there should be some sort of algebraic equation that relates these possible radii or the curvatures. And so this brings us to the work of Descartes. Um, so the curvature is just the inverse of the radius. This will be the uh, important player in today, today's talk. Um, and there's a theorem that was proven in a correspondence between Descartes and Princess Elizabeth that if you have four mutually tangent circles with the curvatures A through D, then twice the sum of their squares is the square of their sums. So it's this really beautiful symmetric equation. You put everything on one side, it still looks very nice. Um, that really, this governs the algebra of the equation. Um, and so this is also why when we talk about a circle packing, we normally start with four circles. It's enough to start with three, but it's nice to start with the fourth one uh, this will be useful when we try to sort of propagate the circles, the circles out. And so we call a quadruple of, say, uh, non-negative real numbers or uh, in real numbers in general, we call these a Descartes quadruple if it satisfies this equation. And if at least three of them are, are positive, you can then just put those in the plane and there actually is a circle packing that corresponds to your equation. So really solutions to this quadratic form are basically one-to-one -one bijection with actual circle packages. Um, so what types of packages you can get? So generically, you get what's called a bounded packing. This is where there's one large circle that encloses everything else. Um, we say the interiors of the circles are all dis disjoint. And the way that makes sense is the outer circle, the interior is the exterior. If you think of this and sort of the completed plane, if you add the point at infinity, there's really no difference between the two the two sides. So um, this one external circle has a negative curvature. Again, that's just a technical thing that doesn't really matter. It just means this is the circle on the other side. There's at most one circle with a negative curvature. Um, so no matter what, how you define random, if you pick a random packing, it'll be a bounded packing. Uh, you can also have the strip packing. So curvature zero radius infinity is a straight line. And so if you have two straight lines, you can pack between the two straight lines. So there's a unique strip packing up to scaling. You can also have a, a half plane packing where you just have a single straight line and you end up packing an entire half plane. So this picture is actually a self-similar picture. If you kind of zoom in your gaze, you can see that it is in fact just a fractal, a fractal like picture. What is the phi? Phi is the golden ratio in this case. This was, I, I got this construction from a paper of, of Holly where she she constructed different types and she made it self-similar. And when you solve the equations to make it self-similar, you ended up getting a, the golden ratio in there. 
Uh, and this is the same five. This is a full plane packing. So this is probably the rarest. Uh, there are packings that can pack the entire plane. Um, for example, this one here, it doesn't make a great picture because I can't really draw the whole plane, but uh, stuff like this. Uh, but for this talk, we're really going to only focus on the bounded packings, unfortunately. Um, so one thing we want to do is figure out what are all the curvatures in a packing. So the basic idea, as I said, is let's say you start with A, B, and C, and you also know D1. So you start with four mutually tangent circles, you know all their curvatures, and you can sort of swap D1 for this other one, D2, because that's the other circle that's tangent to those first three. And you could say, can I figure out D2 from knowing these first four numbers? Uh, and the answer is yes, it's just a bit of algebra. So if you look at the Descartes equation, D1 and D2 are both solutions to this equation for D. So you have a quadratic form in D, so we just solve for D and use a technique called Vieta jumping, where it just Vieta's formulas. Uh, the sum of D1 and D2 is the negative of the D coefficient. So in particular, if I know D1, A, B, and C, you can just solve for D2, just add the other three numbers, double it, and subtract D1. Very simple linear function. Um, so, for example, if I start with this quadruple here, so it happens that I start with four integers, minus 6, 11, 14, 15. If I want to find the curvature of the circle in the middle, I'm just taking the curvature on the outside in red. And so I add 11, 14, 15, you double it, subtract minus 6, you get 86, and that's the curvature in the middle. And so if you just keep doing this, you can fill in all the possible curvatures in the entire packing, just with some very simple linear algebra. So again, you swap out the 11, you can get the one in, you always swap out the red and you get the one in green. The 26 goes, the 14 goes to the 26, and then the 15 goes to the 23. And once again, you just solve this simple linear equation and you, you propagate out the circles. So if you go to infinity, you get a picture that looks something like this. Um, and so these are, these are really the objects we're studying. These are the integral upline circle packings. It's fairly clear if you start with four integers, you add them and you subtract them, you're going to stay an integer. So if you start with four integers and every single curvature in the packing is an integer. Um, so the reason we're not going to study the half plane and full plane packings is those curvatures are not going to be integral. Integral packings are only bounded or the strip packing. So that unfortunately, we, we, we don't get those kind of really cool pictures, but uh, these are still a pretty rich environment to begin with. So that's what I say here. If you start with four, and this is again why we start with four. If you start with three integers, you can solve for the fourth, but it might not be integral, and then you don't retain integrality. But if you happen to find an integral solution to the Descartes equation, then every single curvature in your picture is integral. Uh, we always rescale it so that it's primitive. If there's a common factor, clearly the common factor propagates. Um, and then sort of the basic question at the, the heart of this theory is, what are these integers? So if I go back to the picture, there's a lot of numbers on this page. What are these numbers? Can we describe these numbers? It's all the break integers, also all the break. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you can do this over even like a, yeah, a number field. You can, yeah. I don't know how much people study that, but I think it's, <laughs> no, it's an interesting question. It is an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll just stick to the integers because even that's already hard enough. Um, so first, you can you can think about this question analytically. So um, this picture is a fractal. It's really the same picture all the time. When we assign this integrality to it, it becomes there's we're adding information. But just analytically, um, it's a fractal with Hausdorff dimension approximately 1.3. Um, and it's been proven that the number of circles of curvature at most n is proportional to n to this Hausdorff dimension. And so this doesn't assume integrality. This is true for any app, any circle packing. It doesn't matter what you, your picture is. Um, but since our curvatures are all integral, these fall into n bins. And so the average multiplicity of a curvature is like n to the delta minus 1. So it's like n to the point 3, which, of course, goes to infinity. Um, so this says that the average multiplicity of a curvature in my picture goes to infinity. And so the natural question is, well, therefore, maybe at some point, every curvature actually maybe appears because the average multiplicity goes to infinity, 
it would be reasonable that the individual multiplicities might also go to infinity. That's at least a reasonable statement you could uh, you could try to guess. And so, yeah, so this suggests that every large enough curvature could appear at least analytically. Again, we haven't done anything algebraic. This is just uh, purely what happens uh, from this approach. So we should consider some algebraic constraints. And so the obvious one is mod n. I mean, that's the first place you should always look. And so if we look mod three, uh, you might notice there's only two colors in this picture, uh, zero mod three, and I guess one mod three. Um, and so you actually miss two mod three. And that's not a very difficult thing to prove. Uh, if you look at this graph mod three, it's just a finite graph. You can quickly see that, you know, I don't get two mod three. Um, similarly, if you look mod eight, you see only three colors here. So I guess it's zero, one, and four mod eight. And so you don't get the other five residue classes mod eight. Um, and if you combine these, you get mod 24. And Chinese remainder theorem happens to be true in this case. And so in this case, you only get six of the 24 possible residues mod 24. Um, and this is something that's not too hard to prove in any packing. Mod 24, you'll either hit six or eight of the classes. And so you'll be missing, I guess, uh, 18 or 16 of the possible classes. Um, so there's some algebraic constraints that are always hit, and it's not too hard to prove that, in fact, these constraints must exist. So if we kind of recap the two that we've we've talked about, so analytically, there's nothing, there's no constraints for sufficiently large integers. Of course, if I go back here, I can't fit a curvature 10 in this because it's just not, it's just too small. So as long as you add the word eventually, there's no analytic restrictions to a curvature appearing. And algebraically, mod 24, there's some restrictions. And then you can ask, is this everything? Maybe mod five, there's something. Maybe, maybe there's something else we haven't thought of. Um, and so to this end, we'll call a curvature missing if it could appear in mod 24, but it doesn't. So of course, if it doesn't appear in mod 24, we know it doesn't appear. But if it could appear in mod 24 and it doesn't, then it's reasonable to say it's missing, you know, it should have been here. Sorry, can you repeat what you said when there's no analytic constraints and we can get arbitrary growth conditions? Or... Um, yeah, so we know the growth, we know the average multiplicity is like n to the 0 0.3. So if, if, if the average multiplicity was like, um, if the count up to n was like square root of n, the average multiplicity is like one over root n, you're going to miss something because you just can't hit everything. Mm -hmm. But in theory, the average multiplicity goes infinity, so you're not getting anything that way. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So we'll call a curvature missing if it could appear, but it doesn't. Um, and this brings us to the famous local to global conjecture. So this was originally made by this paper of Graham, Ligarius, Mallows, Wilkes, and Yen. They published this series of papers on circle packings in the early 2000s that really sort of revived the subject. Um, and then it was refined uh, by Fuchs and Sandin. I think the original paper said mod 12. Um, in the paper of Fuchs and Sandin, they, they changed it to mod 24. And the conjecture just states the number of missing curvatures is finite. So in other words, these two behaviors we described completely describe the set of curvatures that appear. That's sorry, well, why mod 24? Um, <laughs> Well, we'll get into that a bit, but we found that stuff happens mod 24. But the mod other things, you can prove it, this doesn't happen. If you start with mod, uh, that is things which are relatively not only visible by some five or by some higher power of two or three, you don't get the same. Um, I'll say something a bit about why 24 in a minute, I guess. Um, but the point is, uh, it's been proven that nothing else happens mod any other number. If, if some things are missed mod n, then n essentially has to be 24. I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Yes. Yeah. So all of, it's not hard to prove that stuff happens mod 24. The difficult thing is to prove that things don't happen at not 24. That's the difficult step. I'll say a bit about it in a minute. Um, so what's some sort of evidence towards this conjecture? So some theoretical evidence. So this is due to Borgain and Kontrovich. Um, they computed the number of missing curvatures up to n is bounded by n to the one minus some small but effectively computable constant. In particular, the density of the missing curvatures is zero or equivalently a density one of curvatures that could appear 
actually do appear. Um, of course, that's all. That's very far from density zero is not finite, um, but it's at least <coughs> some some progress. And this is not this is very difficult work already. This is very a very deep theorem. And so the theorem I was just sort of mentioning is in her in her thesis, Elena Fuchs proved that if a congruence obstruction happens, it happens mod twenty four. So particularly, if you look at this picture, mod five, then all the residues mod five appear. If you look at it, mod forty nine, everything mod forty nine appears. Um, so if you want to look at it, mod n, then twenty four is the "quote unquote" bad modulus. It's the only place that you need to look, or the only place that'll that'll tell you something non-trivial. Um, so this is some theoretical evidence, computationally. So we know the average multiplicity goes to infinity, but this doesn't mean the individual ones do, because you can imagine a situation where some very sparse set has ginormous multiplicities and everything else is multiplicity zero. So you want to sort of check that as you grow larger, the picture of multiplicities seems to be like a normalish distribution that seems to be moving to the right is a reasonable thing you might want to check. Uh, and, and so their work, Fuchs and Sandin made some pictures, sort of briefly explain this picture. Um, they take the packing minus one, two, two, three. They compute up to 10 to the eighth. And then for this residue class of 14 mod 24, for every curvature in their range, they just say, what's its multiplicity? And they make a histogram of those multiplicities. And so in this picture, the average multiplicity is already about 407. <clears throat> and you can see the picture is a, not a normal, but it's a normal-ish. You know, it forms a hump and it kind of curtails around maybe 80 or something. Um, and there's no exceptions in this range. So this is just some sort of light computational evidence that, yes, the average multiplicity is growing, but the individual ones also seem to be growing in like a, a reasonable sense. This is sort of the picture you would ex expect to see if things behave somewhat normally. When you say normal-ish, what do you mean by that? I, mean, I, I don't mean like, like normal, I just mean yeah. Regular 98.4. Yeah. Just as in Boom of you expect them all, the average grows and you expect them all to grow relatively at the same rate. It should be something like a normal, but who knows what the distribution would be exactly. All so you care. You don't conjecture this is a no, 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 no. no. This is just a do the things look like we think they should. Um, if you made the picture and there is like one massive spike. At a humongous number and everything else was zero, that would not be what you expect. So, so is there a heuristic probabilistic model that fits with the with the numerical evidence? I don't think anyone has has studied that. We have not studied that either. Yeah. This, as far as I can tell, was the only paper that did any sort of data, um, any substantial data uh, related to to these things. Uh, but I want to point out one more picture from their paper. So examples in two packings. This one is much smaller mean. This is only a mean of 24. Um, and, but again, you see a similar hump. But I want to point out that actually in this case, there's actually still exceptions. There are still 538 curvatures that have multiplicity zero between these two, between these two numbers. Um, and at the time, it was thought that this just means we haven't gone far enough with our data. We have a hump that's moving to the right, and it just hasn't gone far enough. Um, but as, as it'll turn out that these 538 numbers are not explained by the data not being big enough. In fact, the data is big enough in this situation. Um, and these are actually sort of an indication that something about this theorem conjecture uh, might be a little amiss. So this brings us to an, an REU we ran last year. Um, so in Boulder, it's for undergraduates and first year graduate students. And so our idea was not to study this conjecture. This was not really anything we were thinking about. Um, but we were thinking about, you know, rather than fix a packing and look at the curvature in the packing, what if you fix a curvature and look at the packings that contain the curvature? Some rough idea like this. And so we had an idea to fix a pair of curvatures. You know, you could fix two numbers like 20 and 100 and say, do they appear in a packing together? Some, some simple question you could answer, and you can study this computationally, and maybe you can find something interesting. <coughs> And so one avenue is you just fix the two curvatures and you say, does there a packing occur? You could ask how many packings are there, but even more simply, is there one or, or not one? 
And so, of course, if you make a, a graph of this, you know, if you pick two curvatures and they don't agree mod 24, there's going to be lines of just black dots where they don't occur together because they don't occur together in mod 24. So we'll actually fix two residue classes that could occur in mod 24. And then we'll just make a graph where every pair of numbers and make a white dot if there is a packing and a black dot if there isn't. Um, and basically the pictures we're expecting are basically mostly white. We're expecting a picture with finitely many black dots because when you have small numbers, things are missed because laws of small numbers, but eventually the whole picture should be essentially white. And so I think there's about 117 of these pairs you can make. Um, and in this picture, this is a standard picture. You have a few, might be hard to see, random black dots near the origin. Everything else is wrong. It's not very interesting. But there's one picture that looks like this. Out of all, I think, 117 pictures. And uh, Summer comes to us and she goes, there's this one really weird graph. And so we look at this graph. And not only do these dots not look sporadic, I mean, they're, they're in lines. They're very organized together. And then we had to try to figure out what does that mean? Um, and so the first thought is, this is based on some code we wrote. You know, is there a weird bug in the code that is causing lines? And we decided probably there isn't. And then if you analyze what this means, this means if you take a number of the form 24 times a square and another number of the form eight times a square, where the square is not a multiple of three, these cannot occur in the same packet. Essentially, that's what this picture was, was picking up, um, which it's almost a complete fluke that this picture picked up this packing. Um, but maybe we'll say more about that later. Um, but if this is true, this would mean the local to local conjecture is false in packings that could admit this. So if I have a curvature 28 pack, if I have a packing that has a curvature eight circle, this says I can't have 24 times a square. And that's an infinite family that could occur, but doesn't actually occur. Um, and of course, we had the, the conjecture was that there are only finitely many exceptions, and this is infinite, which is more than finite. Um, and so this brings us to the main result. The main result is there are infinitely many Apollonian circle packings, which the number of missing curvatures is lower bounded by a constant times root n. Um, in particular, that goes to infinity, so the local to global conjecture is false uh, for these packings here. Um, so even more so, oh, we don't, we're not there yet. Um, so what's sort of the most general thing we find? So for each packing, we find families that are either a constant times a square or a constant times a fourth power, um, where the constant sort of one of these four numbers. And these families are entirely missing, but infinitely many of them could actually appear based on mod 24. Of course, if a packing doesn't have some packings only have two and three mod 24. They miss squares, but they miss squares because they don't hit squares mod four. Um, so we're claiming we find these families that are missing when they could actually occur in mod 24, i.e. when it's actually an interesting case. Um, and so we call these reciprocity obstructions uh, because they arise from reciprocity loss. You can probably guess quadratic reciprocity and then the other one uh, actually quartic reciprocity which I previously assumed was completely useless. Um, I, I, I'd seen it before, I didn't think much of it, I kind of moved on and then it turns out it was actually the crucial step for these optic obstructions. Um, and we can also, uh, the results are very precise, given a packing, so given you're starting four numbers, we can tell you exactly which families are missed. Now we don't prove that the other families aren't missed, that's of course gonna be a much harder question, um, but we're pretty confident we found uh, the complete case. So here, we're not gonna spend much time on this slide. This is sort of the main, the main thing. I'll, I'll just point out a couple of things. Given the packing, we, we assign what's called the type. So the type incorporates something about mod 24 and then something about quadratic and quartic. You can write down the type immediately from a starting quadruple. This is just something you can just write down. And so there's 14 possible types and for each type, we list exactly which quadratic families are missing and which quartic families are missing. And then if you look at the mod 24 classes, this tells you, you just look, where do these families intersect these numbers mod 24? And that tells you sort of the residue classes where the local global is false. 
and in the other residue classes, the local to global could still be true. If you take a packing of this type here, 5 mod 24, local to global might still be true for numbers of this form. And in fact, we think it is. Um, uh, but the couple points I want to make, uh, one point I want to make is we have two types, this first one and this 811 one, where we don't find anything missing. And so, in fact, we think local to global is, in fact, true for packing of these types. You mean uh, uh, mod 24 is start with A? So it, I, I won't get into exactly what it means. This means there are eight residue classes mod 24, and one of them is 11. That actually uniquely identifies what happens mod 24. Um, I'll, I'll have some examples with pictures in a bit. But the point of this slide is just to say that um, in every case, you can write down a type, and then you can write down exactly what's missing. Um, yeah. So for example, in this picture here, uh, this is missing all these square families, squares, twice squares, three times squares, and six times squares. You look really closely and you know your squares, you won't, you won't find any of these. Um, this one I think is very interesting because this is not missing squares, uh, but it's missing a bunch of fourth powers. And what I think is interesting, I don't know if, if this is a real phenomenon or not, but I've looked at a few pictures of, of ones that miss these. And not only does it not miss squares, but it seems like there's a lot of squares. There's 361, 121, 441, 196, 441 again, um, and at least a few more. But it seems like there's almost more squares than there should be. Um, I don't know if this is complete baloney or whether there's something interesting there to say, but I've seen this in at least a few of the pictures that are missing specifically the fourth powers. That it seems to like boost up the appearance of squares, but that could be complete nonsense. Um, just for a different example, this is missing twice squares. And finally, this one here, uh, in this circle packing, we don't find any reciprocity obstructions. And uh, we think the local to global conjecture is in fact true for this packing. So it's not disproved for every single circle packing, it's only for, um, I think our rough estimate is about 85% of them uh, have some family that's missing. <laughs> Um, so now I want to say a few words about, about how it's proven. So we'll do this entire proof on this specific packing. If you do it more general, there's some annoying technical difficulties. Um, so we'll just start with this nice packing. This packing is nice because everything is zero on one mod 24. Quadratic reciprocity is much nicer when one of your numbers is one mod four. Sorry, everything is zero or one mod four, not 24. So let's start by fixing a circle. We'll start with this circle curvature five here. And all the circles in blue are all the circles tangent to my circle of curvature five. And so if you look at the list of possible curvatures, so the minus three is the one on the outside, then you just get this list of numbers. And I'm going to arbitrarily write down this quadratic function. Um, 13x squared, 24xy, 13y squared minus five. And if you look at the values of this function, you know that the values actually give you the same list of numbers I started with here. Um, and this turns out to be a general phenomenon um, that we'll talk about next slide. The values of some quadratic function exactly determine the curvatures of the circles surrounding my starting tangent circle. Um, so this is due to an observation of Sarnak that in this example, the values of my function where you take co-prime positive integers are exactly equal to the multi-set of the tangent curvatures of the tangent circles. Um, and in general, this wasn't just a randomly made form. In general, if you have a, a quadruple ABCD um, and you want to fix the first circle, you just write down this nice linear expression here. Um, and this, this, uh, this statement is true for this form here. So that's how we got this quadratic form in the last page. I just took my Schrodinger quadruple and I plugged it into this formula. It wasn't just some randomly guessed, guessed uh, example. Uh, but I also want to point out that if you look at this quadratic formula, if you don't shift it, this is discriminant minus four times a square. Um, so these all actually live in one quadratic field, um, which is also another relevant. 
Um, so the fact that this is discriminant minus four times a squared, you know, if we want to do something about squares, um, the only thing that really makes sense to look at this quadratic form modulo is modulo, say, a. If you look at a quadratic form modulo, a, a divisor of discriminant, something, you know, it should factor as something times a square. And so if we go back to our case here, our function was this. Um, you look at it mod five, the shift disappears, and then you can factor it as three times a square mod five. Um, and so if you take a circle of curvature C that's tangent to my starting circle, and we're going to assume it's GCD with five is one, then the um, Legendre symbol of C over five is just three over five, which is minus one. So this says that if I take any circle tangent to my starting circle, the Legendre symbol of that with five has to be minus one, or it has to be divisible by five. Um, in particular, it cannot be a square because a square will have Legendre symbol one. So this is already like a, a starting step towards, towards seeing that squares might not appear in this picture is we have a basically like a local behavior. Everything surrounding my starting circle is described by something quadratic. And this quadratic has this restriction where um, it only puts non-squares mod five. And of course, zero mod five. <laughs> It could be a square divisible by 25. It could be, yeah. Right now, it could be. All we've ruled out now is that these circles in blue, if they're squares, they must be multiples of five. Is currently all that's ruled out, exactly. OK. And so in general, what we do is if you take a circle of curvature A, Pick any tangent circle of curvature B that's co prime to the starting one. And then we define a function chi 2 is just the Legendre symbol of B over A, which is, of course, plus one or minus one. And so essentially, this computation on the previous slide uh, proves that this is actually a well defined function. Of course, if you did this without any setup, there's no reason why choosing a different tangent circle should give you the same Legendre symbol. The only reason it does is because all these possible values are like governed by this quadratic form. And it turns out that these all have the exact same Legendre symbol. Um, and so you, again, you do the similar computation and this is well-defined for any circle uh, in this starting pattern here, minus three, five, eight, eight. Okay. And so the point is, um, if you have tangent circles, co-prime curvatures, then the value of the first one is B over A. The value of the second one is A over B, but those are in fact equal by quadratic reciprocity. In our situation, all the odd curvatures are one mod four. If you have co-prime numbers, one of them is odd. In this case, it's one mod four. And therefore, these two things are equal. Sorry, that, that is, there's no chi one, right? There's only chi two. Uh, there's only chi, there's chi two and chi four. Oh, chi four is coming later, okay. Yeah. Originally, we called it chi, and then we found there was a four, and then we okay. we said, yeah, there's no chi one. Yeah, so the point is quadratic reciprocity allows us to say that this function, which we define circle to circle, is in fact equal when you have tangent circles of co-prime curvature. And so therefore, there's a natural graph to make, make the vertices, the circles, and draw edges between uh, circles of co-prime curvature. Um, and we can ask, is this graph connected? And it's, it's a fun exercise to show that this graph is connected. Um, in particular, uh, chi two is actually a constant function across the entire circle pack. So you divide it circle by circle, but essentially quadratic reciprocity allows it to sort of propagate along certain tangencies, and it can propagate to the entire packing and not just circle to circle. And so now this is actually a well-defined function on a circle packet. And so here, here's a sample path. If you want to go from, from 5 to 12, 44, you can go from 5 to 8 to 44, but these are not co-prime, so you just have to do a little pit stop at 21 to make it to 44. And that's actually how you can prove it. It's a, it's a very cute exercise. Essentially, if you try to, if you try to jump between non-co-prime ones, you can show that you can go to one in the, in the pinch family between the two. That's co prime to both And so you can sort of take any path and sort of extend it to a co prime path. 
And so what does this mean? So we already showed that chi two is minus one for a starting circle. Therefore, chi two is minus one for every circle. But if you had a perfect square, then chi two of that circle would be one. So therefore, you can never have a perfect square in our picture. In particular, squares. By the way, in my, in my letter where the remark was made, I yep. called those twin primes. So ah. which are tangent, which are both prime. Okay. Then I said I can prove the infinitely many twin primes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> You should read this line, it's very good. <laughs> um, yeah, so in particular in this packing, um, this sort of, it's almost like a hidden invariant. Um, it's, it's just an invariant you can define. You can look at the packing, you can pick two. I'll even go back to the picture. You can just pick, you can look anywhere and you just pick any two co-prime um, curvatures that are tangent and you take the Legendre symbol, it's always minus one. And so, it's almost like hiding in plain sight because it's not a not a very complicated invariant, but you know, unless unless you like look at it, you'll never maybe sort of think of it uh, like that. But I should also point out mod twenty four um, in this packing here. Like we have we have zero mod twenty four. Zero is of course a square mod twenty four, just to prove that in fact this is a legitimate reciprocity obstruction. So squares could occur mod 24, uh, but they do not. So I, I won't really talk about quartic reciprocity. I'll just say a couple words. Um, but the point is, how do you get these sort of quartic families that are missing? And the point is this quadratic form f of x, y, as I said before, the discriminant is minus four times a square. So in fact, this lives in the Gaussian rationals. Um, and you can really sort of replace your form by a lattice. And this is actually the norm form of a certain lattice in the Gaussian rations. Um, and then you can define a appropriate quartic residue symbol to define this function chi four. And then you use quartic reciprocity uh, to allow it to sort of permeate through the entire packing. So it's a similar idea of the proof, but you know, the details are a bit more complicated. Um, we also need some restrictions. We can only do this where all the curvatures are zero mod four or one mod eight. Quartic reciprocity is significantly more complicated and, you know, there's this sort of factor that happens when you reciprocize, I guess, uh, to invent a word. Um, if things aren't of this form, then just everything goes wrong. So the quartic reciprocity, like the elementary, I'm not speaking about uh, mm -hmm. Hilbert symbol, I mean, just the elementary formulation, is it for Gaussian integers? Or? Yes, yes. And uh, can you uh, uh, sketch out the Gaussian integers of square in from the packing? It's, yes, the, the point is if, for example, um, there's something called the Schmidt arrangement, which is a natural placement of all the circle packings in the entire plane. And then in that arrangement, for example, tangency points are all Gaussian rationals. And, Centers are also, I think, Gaussian rationals. <coughs> oh, you are you, first you have to pack it inside the circle. Mm -hmm. And then what is you There's say? basically there's a way to place that in the plane where all the tangency points are Gaussian rational numbers. To place it isometrically or to place it in, in some other way? No, just place it just all the circles have a given curvature. Of course, you can translate it around. But there is a sort of canonical placement of it in the plane where everything is essentially a Gaussian rational. Ah, rational. Okay. Yeah, Gaussian rational, not integer. Okay. But you, yeah. yeah. So this is really all I'll say about quartic reciprocity, but just to give a basic idea, it comes from the quartic reciprocity law. And initially we were, um, we were formulating everything in terms of quadratic, then one day we we found some missing families of cortex where squares appeared and we said, uh oh, there's there's something more going on here. And so we had to add cortex to our, to our things. Um, so what is the new conjecture? So the word missing is already taken. So we'll use the word sporadic to be any curvature that could appear in mod 24 um, that is not ruled out by one of these conditions that we outlined in this in this big table. 
And the new conjecture is now that there are finally many sporadic curvatures. In other words, these obstructions that we list in the table, these are the only, um, these are the only infinite families that, um, for which the local to global conjecture fails. And so why do we believe this? So I wrote some code in C using per EGP um, to actually compute these because this is something you can do in practice. So all this is publicly available on GitHub. Um, and so for various packings, we computed all the curvatures up to either 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 12th. Um, just for, if you're curious, 10 to the 10th, you can run it about a few hours on your laptop. 10 to the 12th takes about a week. Um, and in each of these packings, we sort of find the last sporadic curvature in our range, and we computed 10 times beyond the last sporadic curvature. Um, sometimes a lot more, but in at least 50 of these, we went at least 10 times. So obviously that proves nothing, um, but it just gives some sort of evidence that, you know, it seems like the last sporadic things have petered out. Everything after this point is likely there. Well, at least that's what we, that's what we think. Um, so at least it's sort of evidence that, for example, we're not missing any, um, for example, maybe there's a quadrant family that's missing one example, but our proof doesn't cover it. We don't think there is anything like that that occurs based on this data. Um, so for the last bit, I want to focus on sort of what's the future. So here's a picture of a non-uploading circle packing. Um, so it, it's very similar, but you can tell now curvatures, they sort of appear in sort of rectangles and not mutually tangent to each other. And so, of course, you can ask the question for any of these wide variety of, of generalizations, you know, is there sort of another reciprocity obstruction that happens? So I think that's a very interesting question to, to think about. Um, another one I'll talk about briefly is in, uh, in terms of sort of thin semigroups. Um, so some of this might change a little bit because I was just, just talking uh, earlier, so I might have to improvise a little bit here. Um, but the point is, uh, the Apollonian group is this uh, subgroup of GL4 generated by these four matrices. And so the point is, when you did a circle swap, you did 2A plus 2B plus 2C minus D, uh, which you can think of as, you know, this matrix here. You keep the first three the same and you swap out D for this one here. And so the point is, entries of an orbit of this group are just the curvatures in the packing generated by minus three, five, eight. So really this question about what are the curvatures that appear is just the question of here's a quote unquote thin group, what are the values of the orbits? So there's no geometry at all in this, in this setup, it's just here's a matrix group, what are the orbits essentially? Um, and so then the question is, can we generalize, you know, these reciprocity obstructions to other sort of thin group settings? And so one I'll focus on a little bit is the Remnitz conjecture. So this is a completely different direction. So a continued fraction, of course, is of this form. We're only going to look at finite continued fractions, i.e. rational numbers. Of course, the infinite ones are also very interesting as well, but we're just going to do finite here. And so Zeremba's conjecture is, look at all rational numbers that have continued fractions built from the alphabet one to five. Um, then he conjectures that, in fact, every possible denominator occurs uh, as a continued fraction. So you pick your favorite positive integer. There is some continued fraction using only one to five that lines up with this as its denominator. So you might say, well, why is this a thin group? This looks completely different. Uh, well, I guess we won't get to that quite yet. Um, so, well, um, so the best known result uh, for Zeremba's conjecture is again, a sort of density one, a density one of integers appear as a denominator. This is again due to Borgay and Kontorovich and then his, his uh, student Huang. Um, it's conjectured that one and two suffices for everything sufficiently large. Um, I think someone made the conjecture for one, two, three, four, and then someone made it for one, two, three. Then finally someone made it for one and two. Um, <laughs> so it's just kind of a, through the literature eventually it was got here. You can't make it for one. When you use one, you only get the Fibonacci numbers, <laughs> which are famously not every integer. <laughs> so um, this one, I think the jury is still really far out on because uh, that's a very thin group. 
Uh, but the reason this is a sort of thin group is consider this semigroup. So the plus just means a semigroup. Um, so zero, one, one, and then you put your number. Um, it's not too hard to show that uh, essentially you take the orbit of zero, one, and if you get M over N, this is exactly equivalent to putting those same numbers in your continued fraction, you get the exact same M over N. So asking what numbers appear as a denominator in Zaremba's is exactly saying, what is the lower entry of the orbits of this thin semigroup? And of course, you can see you can replace one to five by any alphabet you like, and you get another thin semigroup, and then you can ask a similar question. What is thin exactly? Well, that's another question. Um, uh, so it's infinite index in the obvious group it's sitting in, like in subgroup of SL to yeah. Z of infinite index. But that's, here there's no index, so there's another notion of thin that, that one, one can make it precise. Yeah, there, I, I think there's there's <laughs> multiple there's multiple floating definitions of what thin is. That's one of them that it's infinite index and it's risky closure. What is thin in a semigroup? Because index sort of loses a bit of notion. It's essentially a notion of, um, for example, you look at the orbits and you look at the growth rate of the orbits. And the growth rate of the orbits is much less than sort of the natural group it sits in. It's essentially <clears throat> one way of saying it. Yeah. It's sort of not large enough to be really the whole group, but not small enough that it's sort of, it's just sort of thin. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this brings us to our, our theorem. So um, we don't really approach the Remus conjecture. I, I think the Remus conjecture is almost definitely true. Um, so you consider all rational numbers that are built out of the alphabet of multiples of four. And so if you take any continued fraction where you have multiples of four, and then you can put any number you like, and then one comma two. So you're kind of building out the multiples of four, and then you're just sort of twisting it at the end. Um, and you can show that this uh, no denominator uh, of this rational number is ever a perfect square, but perfect squares are not outlawed by a congruence condition. <clears throat> um, so squares are not ruled out by, by counting our congruence. And so we actually did a computation for this example. We compute up to two times 10 to the 13th. This took about 150,000 CPU hours on our, some Boulder cluster that I guess not enough people are using. Um, and we think we found in fact, the last missing non-square around eight times 10 to the 12th. But this was just more for fun, just to see if we could get that far. Um, uh, but I wanna point out that this, uh, disproves a generalization of Zaremba's conjecture made by Kontrovich. Um, we're not going to state the generalization, but it's some sort of natural generalization to any alphabet with, with, various, uh, with various properties. Um, so this is sort of a sort of second example of a uh, reciprocity obstruction in a thin group setting. Although, as I've discussed before this talk, um, it seems that this reciprocity obstruction doesn't actually really come from the thinness, but from some sort of larger phenomenon that we're not really going to get into because I don't have the, the, the slides for that. Um, so this brings us to, to the end. So what is a reciprocity obstruction? So these congruence obstructions, you can make a very rigorous theory of them about strong approximation. You can really make a nice theory that says exactly what these are. They're not some sort of ad hoc thing. And so we'd like to do the same thing for reciprocity obstruction, say, I have some sort of quote unquote thin matrix group or semi-group. What does it mean for it to have a reciprocity obstruction? And so our current answer is we don't know what this means. Um, our working definition is it's an obstruction that arises from a reciprocity law. So the examples we had all arose from quadratic or quartic reciprocity. Um, of course, in the literature, when you have sort of a local and global phenomenon, um, a classic way these arise is from a Brouwer mean obstruction, um, which is sort of uh, an instance of like some sort of reciprocity obstruction as well. So this is sort of the informal working definition. And so basically we, you know, you want to find more examples and try to try to find a general framework for 
for what this means, because then you might be able to prove more properties of both. If you want to prove a group doesn't have a reciprocity law, you need a definition of what a reciprocity obstruction is to sort of disprove that, for example. So, so this final, which looks out of place right now, picture, um, Artem's laughing. So I'm in the middle, but you might notice this person on the left here is in this room. So uh, Artem and I actually went to high school together. And so this is a picture from our, our math club in grade 10. <laughs> I, figured I'd ask. I just thought it was kind of cool that this is, I think, 14 years ago. Now we're both, we're both, uh, we're both here today. So thank you. Are there any questions for James? I mean, as we discussed before, and I think this shows the fact that you have a, a quartic reciprocity or quadratic form mm -hmm. is an indication that that is different to the second one. Right. In the Zaremba, where you just quadratic, so uh, mm. it's an indication of this difference that we were discussing that. Um, right. Some some of these obstructions already could so you might have a thin group or a thin semi group you take this congruence cl closure mm -hmm. and already there you might have a reciprocity and that's kind of standard in the theory of quadratic forms yeah and the beautiful thing about your Apollonian case is that you propagate the the Legendre symbol that's the sign you're using generators mm -hmm. while if you can have a reciprocity which is coming from a global group you're going right, to right. generate. So I, love, yeah. so I think the, there's quite a big difference between your two works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it's really a thin group phenomena that you have this reciprocity in, yeah. in the Apollo. No, I, yeah, I, I agree there, yeah. This, this doesn't come from the thinness. This comes from essentially something happening in gamma 104, which is, of course, a, a uh, congruent subgroup. Yeah, so that one is is a is a brow money in obstruction. So if we yeah, formulate yeah. properly, it is is a brow money in obstruction, while the, the, the other one uh brow money doesn't have generators. Yeah. Our our thought is maybe it's it's like a variant of a brow mean obstruction, but on like supported on infinitely many primes, whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so it was said that those obstructions are brow, I mean. The quartic and quadratic ones of our money in fibers actually can be reduced to power money obstruction. So, no, the other way around. Uh, the quartic and quadratic ones from the Aplonian uh, can't be. Well, we or, never say can't. Well, I can't say can't, but <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> we don't think. <laughs> One important function is for Brower Manin obstructions, you're, you're really looking at a finite number of primes. And here we really sort of need infinitely many primes. So that's some one fundamental difference in some, some vague sense. We're not showing a Legendre symbol of X over P is preserved. We're showing a Legendre symbol of two numbers is preserved. Those numbers can have any prime factors. We don't really have anything. We have nothing concrete. But this also relates to the fact that we don't really know what what exactly how to how to formulate even a framework? So so if you let your your four generators generate groups, then mm -hmm. will they be con like congruence? Uh, oh, the four Apollonian generators, right? Um, no. Okay, so so like ah, uh, so they, the group itself is. Okay. Yeah, they naturally fall into uh, some an orthogonal group. If you write down the um, Descartes equation. You can consider all the matrices that preserve that quadratic form. That's an orthogonal group. This is a subgroup of that group. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's but it's much, like, much smaller. Like, 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 it's not even congruency in, in that group. Yeah, it's not even congruence in that group. That's the very definition of thin. It's infinite index yeah. in okay in in the full group. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you said that. There are packings where squares don't appear, but you have some packings where squares really appear. Yeah. So how, how far have, it, have you done numerics on that? Is that... Um, I have done no numerics on that. So that was, 
Um, so that's not really explained by the quadratic, like, no, that's pretty. All I've done is look at a few pictures and look at the large numbers and see there's a lot of squares. That's as far as I've taken it. Um, because you can do some numerics about like what percentage should they appear. I haven't done any of that. I've just noticed that I see a lot of squares, whereas here, um, well, squares can appear because of mod four, but you look at a packing where squares could appear and they're not outlawed. Typically, you don't see like a lot of squares, except for for some reason when fourth powers are outlawed. It seems like maybe you see a lot of them. Up. Yeah. But no, definitely numeric should be done, but you know, lots to do so little time. So how to draw those pictures? Ah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I wrote code that automatically makes them in LaTeX, does it all for you. Um, it's what, what code? It's there's on, on my GitHub. There's there's a, a it's in Perry GP a package that will. What is GitHub? Place where you download stuff. Yeah, what we'll place where you upload code? Um, yeah, it's not. It's just some some sort of simple geometry. Given four of them, you can figure out the geometric equations to generate the fifth, and then you can then generate all the circles and centers, and then you just have to make that in LaTeX. Um, so you, I, probably, you probably use this. You you write a a, a script that produces sticks code. Though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so because it would be very annoying to then do that all yourself. Yeah. I should mention there's other. I'm sure I know other people have made pictures in their in their talks and papers, so they also have implementation to this in various other places. You can probably find other things online too. Are there questions from Zoom? Okay, if not, let's thanks, James again.